and I'll introduce our panelists and we'll go from there. So good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to our third uh, Caledon Community Consultation for the Development of 60 Caledon. My name is Lauren Blumis. I'm the Director of Corporate and Legal at Victoria Park Community Homes. Uh, if you joined us on either of the previous two sessions, I will look familiar to you. Um, so I'll just start by introducing really briefly Caledon Community Collaborative. Um, Caledon Community Collaborative is a partnership between Hamilton East Qantas Nonprofit Homes and Victoria Park Community Homes. Uh, both organizations are affordable nonprofit housing providers that are headquartered in Hamilton and collectively own and manage uh, over 3,000 units in Hamilton and beyond. Our two organizations have a long history of collaboration and came together when the um, offer of the 60 Calden site uh, came up for sale by the city to put in a, uh, an offer to purchase to develop the site for uh, much needed affordable housing in Ward 8. For more information, if you're interested to learn a little bit more about our organizations, what we do, our history in Hamilton, and how the collaborative came together, and also how we came to purchase the land, I'd refer you back to our website, uh, which you've all registered through, but it's caledoncc.ca, where you can watch the uh, first two webinars that we hosted, where we went over that in detail, or otherwise take a look through the slide deck, which are also posted there. Tonight, the intention is to be presenting the rezoning and official plan amendment application that we have submitted and to review the site plan concept, um, the site plan concept. So we'll be looking at like what the site will really look like and what that will mean for the community. Uh, after which we will be doing a question and answer period. So that's primarily what tonight is. We'll have about a 15 minute presentation on our application and then really we'll be opening it up to you to ask questions to our panelists. Um, so getting to our panelists, we have four here tonight. I will be moderating the questions. So um, at any time throughout, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, um, there is a Q&A function. And you can type questions at any time. You can wait to the end if you'd like, but you don't need to. I'll be keeping track of them. Um, and then moderating them after we get through the presentation. So our first panelist is Brenda Kess. Brenda, if you wanna wave and say hi. 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 Uh, Brenda Kess is a senior planner at GSP Group's Hamilton office with 35 years of land use planning experience in both the public and private sectors. She has extensive experience in urban redevelopment secondary planning, coordinating land development projects, and securing development approvals on a wide range of projects. Brenda is actively involved in the community as a member of Hamilton Halton Home Builders Association, the Mohawk College Urban and Regional Planning GIS Program Advisory Committee, the OPPI Western Lake Advisory District Executive Team, and the Greater Hamilton Professional Planners Advisory Group. Brenda has been retained on the Calden project as our planner, and she's been the lead on the rezoning and OPA application submission, and she will be taking us through that um, uh, presentation shortly. Our second panelist tonight is Brian Sibley. Brian, if you could take yourself off mute, say hi, and give a wave. Hello. Thank you. Brian is the executive director of Hamilton East Kiwanis Nonprofit Homes, Inc., and has been so since 2014. He has over 40 years of experience in public and nonprofit sector management and administration. For much of his career, Brian has been involved in developing, implementing, and managing programming aimed at servicing marginalized client groups, including the development of a number of transitional housing projects, working with youth, and adult at risk of homelessness and criminal involvement. Uh, he completed his undergraduate degree in social work and a master's degree in business administration with distinction, focusing on nonprofit management and social enterprise sustainability. He is a registered social worker with the Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers. Our next panelist is Lorianne Gagne. Lorianne, can you take yourself off mute and say hello? Hey everyone. 
Thank you. Florian is the CEO of Victoria Park Community Homes. She joined Vic Park in 2014, bringing with her over 30 years of experience in social housing. She began her social housing career in 1986 with a development consulting firm in Northern Ontario. In 1992, Lorian launched her own property management firm in Sudbury, Marlar Management, specializing in nonprofit and cooperative housing. During her 14 year tenure, Lorian gained, gained an appreciation of the challenges faced by providers in trying to deliver safe, affordable community housing. Lorian relocated to Southern Ontario in 2006 to join the Agency for Cooperative Housing. And in 2009, Lorian joined the Housing Services Corporation as manager of stakeholder relations before joining Victoria Park in 2014. Okay, and our final panelist is Peter Gong. Peter, will you do the same? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Peter is a director at Elliston Capital in the Asset Management Group. Uh, currently involved in all stages of project execution for various multi-family residential projects. Peter is involved from the early stages of land due diligence and acquisition through to rezoning and city approvals, as well as design and construction. Prior to joining Elliston, Peter was a project manager and completed a number of construction projects totaling over $450 million. He has a full life cycle construction experience in several asset classes, including multifamily residential, healthcare, aviation, and hospitality sectors. Peter is active in nonprofit work and is passionate in building a better global community. Over the years, he's served in leadership capacity on various nonprofit endeavors, including Bridges to Prosperity, Canstruction, UW Leaders in Infrastructure, Hand Up Toronto, and Endeavor Consulting. And Ellis Dawn has been retained by Caledon Community Collaborative as our development consultant on this project. And Peter has been our technical expertise on, uh, expert on this project so far and sort of leading the way on that. So without further ado, I'm going to put myself on mute and hand it over to Brenda to launch into the presentation. Thank you. Can everybody see that? I'm hoping that's a yes. Great. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us this evening. And um, we're very excited about this um, redevelopment of 60 Caledon Avenue of the former school site. Um, so what, what I want to do tonight is provide you with uh, just some information, some planning information for those of you that may not be familiar with planning um, regarding some of the things that, that we have to look to when we justify, um, look to justify a change in land use and change in official plan or zoning documents. Um, so with respect to the proposed development, we have to look to the provincial policy statement. Um, there have been two provincial policy statements, the most recent one in 2020. And one of the key, uh, some of the key policies to consider um, are, are on the right side there. So both the provincial policy statement as well as, as the 2019 growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe are provincial policies that we have to, uh, first of all, with respect to the policy statement, we have to be consistent with them. And with respect to the growth plan, um, we have to be in conformity with them. So some of the key policies there that I've highlighted, they're by no means anywhere near all the policies that we have to look at, but they support intensification within the built boundary. Um, so this, is, this particular site is obviously within the city's built boundary. Um, it provides affordable housing, which is also one of the key policy objectives of those documents. The proposed density is transit supportive, which is a key policy um, at a provincial level, as well as the provision of um, a diverse housing stock and a compact, compact built form. With respect to the Urban Hamilton Official Plan, if any of you are familiar with it, it's quite a hefty document. One of the key items in there pertain to the intensification that is to occur within the city. So the city has targets for different areas. And this particular property is located within a neighborhoods designation where based on the um, provincial targets and the city's targets, 40% of residential intensification is supposed to occur within that area. 
Um, and in addition, the official plan supports the provision of affordable housing. When it comes to the proposed development, this is what we call a site plan view. And for those of you that aren't familiar with it, we'll be providing a different perspective, which, which should help you. Um, what's a little confusing is north is to the right, um, but Caledon Avenue and Tyrone Drive are shown um, along the, the left and the bottom of the page. So the way that the site is proposed to be developed is with two main driveways. Um, one um, starting basically in a, aligned with Lotus Drive and the other one further to the south or further to the left, um, which, which provides a almost a loop road system for the overall development. We're looking at two um, main blocks of back-to-back -to -back townhouses. Now, the ones that are along Tyrone, they're divided into three blocks. They're back-to-back -back townhouses. And we're looking at a total of 58 back-to-back -back townhouses combined between Tyrone and Caledon Avenue. In addition, we're looking at providing um, two apartment blocks each with a maximum height of eight stories. And they've both been stepped from three stories up to six stories and then eight to, up to eight stories. And 264 apartment units are, propo are proposed um, within these, divided between these two buildings. And last but not least, we have a lovely central community amenity area um, that is located in that, that um, cloud area in green in the middle. Um, so that gives you just a general idea of what is proposed to be developed. The rest of the site is proposed for parking areas um, and, and landscaping. Oops, sorry. So the density that we're proposing is 112 units per hectare and the maximum height is eight stories and that's only for the two apartment blocks. And this area here, if you can see my cursor, I think you can, is where the eight stories is located. So next, this gives you a view that I think is a little easier for you to understand. Um, along the bottom, along Caledon Avenue, you can see the existing development as, long as, as well as the existing development along Tyrone. And what I wanted to show you here was really um, what the distances are that we're talking about to give you a better idea. So in terms of Tyrone Drive, you can see here that the building will be set back about 10 meters from the sidewalk. Um, so that gives you an idea. So it's 10 meters plus the road, then we get to the development on the south side of Tyrone. In terms of the location of the apartment buildings from Tyrone, um, we're looking at approximately 67 meters from the sidewalk again. Then when we go along Caledon Avenue, the, the first level, so the first three story part of the apartment building is about 10 meters from the sidewalk along Caledon and the back-to-back -back townhouses, those units are about 13 meters from the sidewalk. And then if you look at the far, at the top, um, the far Northern part, the um, eight story portion of the building is about 55 meters from the rear yard of those units um, that are backing onto the Northern limit of the site. So for looking at what it's going to look like at the street level and to give you an idea of what, what's happening there. So this would be, this particular view is Tyrone, Tyrone Drive. So you're going to have driveways, individual driveways, um, for individual units. These units are two stories in height along Tyrone. And there's about, I believe there's 15 of them. Um, so there's 15 units along Tyrone. So there'll be 15 driveways and each driveway will be to ACE one unit. Uh, what you see at the back there where the number three is, those are units that are accessed from the other side. So there aren't any entrances for those units along Tyrone. The, the, the owners of those units or the renters of those units will access the site internally in order to, to gain access to them. And the same is true for the street edge along Caledon Avenue. These units are set back um, like an individual driveway that will have a car as well as landscaping. Next, we have that lovely amenity space that I showed you before. So this is just an artist rendering of what that amenity space could look like. Um, some really cool features that we're looking at would be um, open, like significant open lawn areas that you can see here. 
um, as well as a central pavilion, some picnic tables and benches. We've got a potential community garden that you can see this area here, as well as some sport, a sports court and a tot lot and play area. That's what those weird shapes are there to, to, to resemble some of the some of the uh, the facilities or, or the equipment that could be located within that tot lot. In addition, there's a secure bicycle storage area in proximity. So if you're staring at this picture, just to give you an idea, um, you can see in the bottom right corner here, it says pedestrian access to or from Caledon Avenue. So that's how you would get to it from the street from Caledon Avenue. You can get up to this area, the central courtyard area. Now we get to the planning stuff, which is rather boring, but it's really the main reason why, why we have to make these applications. So the site is designated neighborhoods. And what you see here is a picture of a schedule that's in the official plan that identifies that the site is designated neighborhoods. Now that neighborhood designation permits a wide range of uses. It permits the type of uses that we're looking for, um, but in terms of the density that we're looking at, the medium density residential, which, which we would be looking at, permits a maximum, de maximum density of 100 units per hectare and a maximum height of six stories. So we would need a site-specific amendment to the official plan to allow for a maximum height of eight stories for the apartments and to permit an increase in that density from 100 to 112 units per hectare. So that's the official plan amendment application that would be submitted to the city, that has been submitted to the city. Now, from a zoning perspective, the purpose of the zoning bylaw is to implement the official plan. So this is a, a, a cutout of the schedule of the zoning schedule in zoning bylaw 05-200. And it zones the site, obviously a community institutional zone, to reflect the school use of the property. Um, that existing zone also allows single detached dwellings, but it doesn't allow anything more than that. So we need to rezone the official the, the zone, sorry, we need to rezone the site to permit the type of development that we're looking for, which is back-to-back -to -back townhouses and apartments. And to allow an increase, this, this is what's strange, is we're asking for an increase in the front and side yard setbacks because the new urban zoning really looks to push the buildings close to the street. And in this case, we wanna reflect what exists across the street in terms of setbacks. So we're asking for an increase in front and side yard setbacks to reflect what we see across the street, but to allow an increase in the maximum height of eight stories for the apartments only. So as a part of our submission um, application to the city, we went through a formal consultation process and the city tells us what studies were required to submit. So this is the long list of studies that we prepared and submitted with our application. So there were engineering studies, transportation studies, heritage studies, various impact assessments, as well as design and planning studies. So everything you see in front of you has been submitted to the city and will ultimately be available for your review. From a planning analysis perspective, as I mentioned earlier, we're subject to the provincial policy statement, the growth plan and the urban Hamilton official plan. So what you see here are from a planner's perspective, how we meet those, um, the policy statement and the, the growth plan, as well as the urban Hamilton official plan policies. So it's, it's a very high level general, generalization, but we consider this development to be um, an excellent location, this site to be an excellent location for intensification. Um, it's currently underutilized in its current state. It provides for transit supportive development, we're looking for um, a much improved public realm versus basically just, just an open lawn, um, as well as we're, we're providing a sufficient parking supply to, to meet the zoning requirements. And we feel the way we've designed the site, and I'll go into a little more detail, uh, is, is compatible with the, with the development that's across the street. It's not the same as, but it's compatible with it. So in order to be compatible, you don't have to have the same development, but you have to have certain features that are, that are respective of what exists in the area. So just to give a summary of the planning process. So we're looking at, um, at the, the top left corner of the, of the pie is community consultation. So we've had, this is our third community consultation with you um, to we've, it's not in terms of explaining the development but leading up to what we've, what we submitted to the city. So on the right side, the blue color, we have submitted the application to the city. And this, this blue area is, is, a big, is a big step for us. Um, to get all those studies complete to the city's requirements. Next, you go to the orange block in the bottom right, 
And what the city does is it circulates our application to various departments and agencies for their comments. So it'll go to the zoning section and the engineering section. We're also, we will also be required to post a public sign on the property, a pub public notice sign that will provide you with um, a contact person at the city to contact if you have any questions about the application, um, as well as give you some details as to what we're applying for. And what I've explained to you is what we're applying for. Um, so what happens next is what, after it's circulated to the various departments and agencies, we get the comments back. So we'll get, um, if you were to write a comment or contact the city, we would get a summary of that. We wouldn't know who it came from, but we would know that certain comments came in. And we get a copy of all those comments. And what we do next is we take a look at all those comments and we see if we can address them. We can see, we see whether or not, oh, you know what, they've asked for this, so I think we can do that. Um, let's say, just to give you an example, let's say we didn't have enough parking. They would say, well, you know, we're not prepared to support a reduction in parking, so we want you to add more parking. So in this case, parking isn't an issue, um, and, and we're in good shape from a parking perspective. But, but they may want, um, maybe they want us to have uh, smaller setbacks or greater setbacks in certain areas. So we have to look to all of those types of things and make sure that we satisfy all the comments. Assuming that we've satisfied all the comments, the next step is obviously for us to um, look to get a positive staff report from city planning staff. And what happens is the, the city planning staff will prepare a planning report to the planning and development committee with recommendations. So they will either recommend supporting, um, supporting it with modifications or denial. And at that meeting, at that planning committee meeting, that is a statutory public meeting where you will have the opportunity to speak directly to the councillors um, that sit on the planning committee and you can either speak in support of or against the applications. And you can um, identify what your concerns or, or how supportive you are. Following that meeting, it would go to council for final approval. So that's that's your planning process in a nutshell. Um, the planning council has final approval, um, albeit there is the opportunity, depending upon the perspective, the application could be appealed to the Land Use Planning Appeals Trib Tribunal, that's LPAT. But for all intents and purposes, council has, has the approval of our application. Um, yep, that, that's it. So I know I was quick and I, and I went over a lot of things. I'd be happy to answer any questions um, and explain things a little more fully if you're interested. What you see in front of you are, are those perspective drawings that the renderings that we had prepared that give you just an idea contextually of what it could look like from various vantage points. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Brenda. And we do have lots of questions uh, trickling in. Um, again, for anybody that is looking for the Q&A function, uh, if you take your cursor to the bottom of your screen, you'll get a toolbar that comes up and along the middle there is Q&A with two little sort of uh, chat boxes. That's where you can type in your questions and you'll see open questions to be answered. Uh, a few questions have been answered. I was able to do sort of on the fly um, and otherwise we'll go through them and I will uh, ask one of our panelists or perhaps two to speak to each one. So let's start uh, with the very first question from Derek. Derek asks, and Brenda, I think this is a question um, that you can answer and perhaps it, it may have been answered by your presentation, but if you can speak to whether the uh, city official plan supports eight story buildings within the interior of the neighborhood designation. Okay, in terms of the Urban Hamilton official plan, it, it does not, which is why we've applied for an official plan amendment. So the official plan currently says that for a medium density development, it's a maximum height of six stories. So the official plan has to, we're requesting that the official plan be amended to increase the height to eight stories. Okay. And that's great, thank you for that. And Derek, if you have any other questions stemming from that, feel free to just, again, add to the, the Q&A and we'll get to that in order. Okay, um, this question I am going to pose to uh, Brian and Lori Ann. This is from Greg. Greg is saying, this is too much density for the area. Homeowners feel that's, that this is way too much. Is it set in stone? So perhaps Brian, if you want to start, and then Lorianne, um, if you have anything you'd like to add, or uh, then please jump in. 
Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, the uh, I think what Brenda has been has been uh, saying in her presentation is that this is a process. This isn't an end product. This is uh, this is part of uh, what we are requesting. What we feel as uh, as uh, the Caledon Collaborative makes sense from a financial perspective and 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 uh, you know a, a, an ongoing operational perspective. That doesn't mean that this is the final project. I mean, it's, uh, it's a process. And as Brenda suggested, uh, consultation is important to the planning process. And uh, there's lots of opportunities for you to have input in this. And uh, the city will ultimately and the council will ultimately make a decision about what they're willing to accept. At that point, it'll come back to us and say whether or not this continues to be a feasible project for us. So it, it's a balance and it's a process and it's not a not necessarily a short term process. I'd uh, I, you know, asked Brenda, actually, what's the average time that you see this process is taking? Well, that that can actually range considerably. Um, it can take anywhere from um, uh, a year to two years. Great. And that, is there, that, oh, I'll just add one thing that mm -hmm. that extension in the time period usually deals with things like trying to resolve issues. So it's going back and forth. Perfect, thank you. Okay. I think that answers that question pretty well. Um, in that case, I'm gonna go on to a, a sec second question uh, by Greg and Lorianne, perhaps you want to start in on this one and Brian, if you'd like to add in, please do. Uh, this is from Greg. There, um, this is, there is no garden, this is no garden park as it's surrounded by apartment buildings only used for this development. Can this be changed? Sure, thank you for this question. Um, I can indicate that it's not intended to be just for this uh, development, which is why we wanted to make sure there were access points in between the buildings. I know it can, can, it can seem um, enclosed. There is a reason the landscaping, the sloping of the site uh, didn't allow us a great deal of flexibility where to put it or where to put the buildings um, for maximum space usage. So that's ultimately where it ended up. It is, like I said, a long Caledon. We do plan to keep it completely open. You can access further up from Caledon as well. It is intended that this is open space to be shared by the community. Um, perhaps I could simply add, in terms of the locations for access from the streets for, for the public, it's off of Caledon where my, you can see there's, there's actually a, a walkway that's been created from Caledon because you're going up a hill here, right? Um, you all know the site very well. In addition, there's a public walkway on the far southern end down here off of Tyrone where the intersection of um, Tyrone is with, oh, I forget the name of that street. How? I forget, um, the street that's down here, you can access a walkway right over here that can take you into the into the open space amenity area, as well as directly from Caledon along from the sidewalk closer to Lotus Avenue. Okay, thank you. And I just wanna say uh, to all the panelists, if there's anything on any of these questions and I haven't said you want to add, please jump in, even if I didn't direct the question to you specifically. Okay, so this question comes from a Victor. Um, oh, sorry, Victoria. Within the central amenity area, will there be a community center or community room in which residents and community members can utilize for community planning team meetings, community events, et cetera? So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask Brian perhaps to speak to that. Yeah, the plan is to have amenity space. It'll be in uh, department buildings though. So we're not talking about a separate community center in the park as a separate building. It would be incorporated within the existing structures. But, uh, you know, it, it's important when you're creating a community, it's important that you have space for communities to meet, for communities to, uh, to you know, have an opportunity to plan, uh, to gather, to do all sorts of things. So, I mean, that's the intention. Make this, uh, make this a community-based uh, uh, that, that adds to the neighborhood. Okay, thanks, Brian. 
Um, the next question is from Sue. It, uh, I'm seeing Sue. Um, there's some frustration in, the, in, in your question. And so I'm going to break this out because I think you're asking a few different things. And the first I'm, I'm going to ask Peter to respond to, which is um, really about water flow. So how do you expect to build on a live water stream? So if you could yes. speak to, to that, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, so there's a couple things to kind of address there. Uh, but first up, we've studied the site extensively. All the geotechnical conditions below grade, we've studied it extensively. Uh, first, actually, by WSP in 2018. And as we know, I mean, geotechnical conditions doesn't really change in the course of two years, but we gone, we went back and did it again uh, just this past summer. And essentially what we found is um, the, so the bedrock is about three to six meters below grade. We weren't able to, or we didn't find any live stream or water stream conditions below the, the, the building itself. Further, as far as the hydrogen uh, G conditions, um, you know, the groundwater level is about one and a half levels of meters below the lowest point of our excavation. But what you'll notice is all of the buildings that we propose on this site do, they don't have basements. So all the parking is above grade and everything that is below grade is only the foundations to support the structure above. So again, um, we're not, we're, we're not only are we not uh, dipping into any sort of live water stream conditions below grade, but uh, we're actually well above the groundwater table uh, completely. So we're not anticipating any sort of permanent discharge as well as a part of this de uh, development. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, the second part of this question is one that um, we we have heard before, and we we've we've got this question. Um, I, I think this is a common misconception about affordable housing, and and I'll ask Brian to speak to that, which is um, that this development is going to increase crime in the area, uh, increase insurance rates for the homeowners. I, I imagine connected to a, a feeling that there may be an increase in crime. Um, and erode, um, erode value, uh, sorry, home value. And, and there's some frustration there. So, and then I think, you know, yeah, we, please go ahead on that, Brian. Okay, and you know, I, I think that what we're talking about here is, is a little bit of concern about the unknown and the impact on a neighborhood. I mean, this is an established neighborhood. And so I think that the, the questions are legitimate. Um, so I, I'm going to try to break this down into to a, a couple of different issues here. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is property values. And I'm going to talk about this from a personal perspective as well. I live in the uh, east central part of Hamilton, uh, where Kiwanis Homes is the largest property owner in Ward 3. Uh, I live in the middle. I, I mean, I don't live one in a Kiwanis Homes property, but my potential, my property is... Uh, within walking distance of 300 Kiwanis Homes units. Uh, the property values in our area are the highest rising property values in, in Hamilton. Uh, so, you know, there isn't necessarily, you know, the, the impact on property values because of affordable housing is a bit of a misconception, okay? And uh, I would say that we can refer you to studies on that. The bigger issue I think here is, is that's coming out though, is you're talking about density. Right. And as you increase density, you also increase things that go along with density. And, and so the crime rate in the neighborhood is not a factor of, of you know, uh, whether this is affordable housing or whether it's condominiums. The uh, crime is not a, a factor of, of, you know, poverty. Crime is a factor of, of where you, you force issues into uh, concentrated areas, right? So, you know, what we're looking at here is we're looking at creating a mixed income community that uh, provides housing for families, uh, for seniors. It's as much, uh, you know, a, a focus for us to ensure that crime does not rise in this community as it is for anybody in the neighborhood. This is a shared concern. Um, we do not, there, there's no indication that crime rates go up. Now, when you have more density and more population, you're obviously going to have more, more crime, but that's not relating to the type of people coming in. It's related to the fact you just have more people. Um, and then the issue of uh, flow, I mean, that's, that's an issue that is, you know, 
is is being studied and you know we will have to be discussing with the city partners and how we can how we can best handle that traffic flow uh, i don't know laurianne if you have something to add no i think you said it well yeah great Thank you. And, and just further to uh, Brian reference studies, we do, if you go to our website, calendancc.ca, we have frequently asked questions. This is one of those frequently asked questions and there's reference to some studies there if you'd like to take a look. Okay, the next question is gonna be for Laurieann and it's not so much a question, it's, it's a comment about um, uh, Victoria Park, uh, housing that is currently on Caledon and that it is unsightly and there's some issues with garbage. Um, so Greg is saying the area can't handle any more of any more of that. So maybe perhaps you could speak to um, the uh, portfolio that is on Caledon. Sure, thanks for the comment, Greg. And sorry to hear that garbage is a concern in that neighborhood. Um, it was raised with us. We take any concerns raised very seriously. As Brian mentioned, we're a member of the community right along with you. Now, I heard some feedback from Lauren when she was delivering the flyers and this first came to, um, came to us saying there are concerns. One of the comments was, once we call to complain, it's corrected. So I, I do good kudos that we get out there and we correct it, but you shouldn't have to call to have it, have it addressed. I will say that you know, waste management was not as much of a forefront issue in older developments, so it can be a challenge. Um, with this Caledon development, we took that, it put it sort of in the forefront, and we have a completely sort of on-site, they're called Molochs, internal to the site, to ensure that there are no additional waste challenges. And, and then I'll just end saying we really appreciate the honest feedback because as your community partners, we do act on this community feedback and we agree that tenant education is an important piece and we'll take that away. Great, thank you. Um, so this question is for either Brenda or Peter. Um, the roads and the park, will they be under public or private ownership? I can take it, Peter. They'll be private. Great. Thank you. Okay. So the next question comes from uh, Chris. So Chris is uh, worried about the eight, the eight stories. Um, and is wondering about, he lives on Caledon a half a block away and the streets Caledon, Lotus and Tyrone don't, uh, do not support the traffic that would come from 300 units. Um, also concerned about taking away the green space. Um, and so the question was again, why so many units? So I'm, I'm gonna parcel this one out a little bit too and say uh, one could, um, Peter, I'm going to ask perhaps you to speak to the traffic study and um, the implications of 300 units. And then after that, I think I would ask Brian or Lorianne to talk about, you know, why, why we look for density, um, what it means to the viability of this project and the success of affordable housing. So we'll start with Peter. So I'll jump in there with the parking. I mean, this is something that we pay a lot of attention to and uh, we spend a lot of time studying. So for this, I mean, we've commissioned a consultant to specifically look at both parking and traffic of the adjacent areas. Uh, and essentially the conclusion is the local areas do support the density that we are proposing for this site. So we've studied specific intersections up at Mohawk and Caledon, uh, as well as Lotus and Upper James, as well as the kind of the uh, surrounding um, local area roads. And, uh, and again, the conclusion is it does support the density that we're proposing. Um, we are anticipating kind of revisiting the studies. We're gonna continuously update them, um, you know, as, 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 as time evolves, as we go through the transition process. But uh, that's, uh, we, we do have um, engineering data to support uh, this development here. I hope that answers the question. 
Yeah, I, I think it does. Thanks, Peter. And then on the, on the question of like why density, um, I, I think what I what the question might be getting at is like why why are we looking for eight stories? What does and and I think the question uh, what would be interesting to hear from Brian and Lori Ann is why that matters um, to this project. Uh, I'll I'll jump in there first if if, if you like. Uh, you know, part part of uh, the challenge with uh, you know affordability in um, when, when you're looking at affordable rents is that when you when you uh, have uh, land costs compounded by building costs compounded by by uh, operational costs uh, that go along with the site, there's a certain uh, there's a certain amount of density that's just required for for. A, uh, a complex like this just to be sustainable, uh, considering that we would not be charging what would normally be the expected market rents in Hamilton. Okay, so we're not looking at operating condos here. We're looking at operating uh, buildings that will be ours forever, right? And we look at it from, uh, you know, first and foremost, the building has to pay for itself without us depending on government subsidies beyond what we will get at the front end to help us build it, but long-term ongoing government subsidies. So we have to make sure that these units pay for themselves. We also have to make sure that these units are environmentally sustainable because that's a, a huge operational cost that we will have going forward is, you know, the challenge of greenhouse gas emissions and energy. So, so we need to make sure that we're, we're, putting the, the energy uh, sustainability into these buildings at the front end is a huge cost to that. And uh, finally, we also, you know, have to have amenities. We have to have green space. We have to have amenities within the buildings to create communities. Uh, there's a cost to, to that. When you talk about all those costs, it means that you need a certain amount of, of uh, density just to be able to service the debt that we're going to incur. This is not a, a $10 million project. This is a $130 million project of which we've got to, uh, to support. And the rents need to be able to support that. And the rents lower than market. So that's why density is a really important part of this. We cannot depend on uh, government subsidies on an ongoing basis to continue to maintain the operation of this this complex. So, so that's why we're aiming for uh, the highest density that we can get within reason. You know, Lorianne? No, that's absolutely right, Brian. Um, and one of the other things, if I could just circle back, because there may be some people who are new on, on this call, haven't been on the first or second session. So just a bit of a reminder that it was the city of Hamilton that bought this site from the school board. And when they listed it for sale, it was with the intention of affordable housing throughout the complex and greater favorings given to increasing the density to achieving that goal of affordable housing. So we're coming in as a fellow community sort of partner to meet the city's goals in this as well. That's right. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is, is similar to what we've heard, um, but concerned about the green space. And I'm wondering if maybe Brenda or Peter, or perhaps both of you could speak to the challenge on like, why, did, why is the green space internal to the park and the, the, the physical challenge with the site um, in having that, and also from the perspective of, of um, like viability for the proponents, why, why it's internal and not um, adjacent, directly adjacent to Caledon? Sure, yeah. Do you want me to go first? Yeah, please, I'll, Peter. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on it from kind of the engineering perspective and, and maybe Brenda can kind of add in. Um, I mean, the biggest issue that we have on this site is, is in fact the grading. So the challenge is, is it, it dips quite a bit from one end to the other. So in order to provide uh, good programming, you know, functional space, I mean, for a park generally, by and large, your space needs to be flat. Uh, if it's on a hill, you can't really use it for uh, as many you know, purposes as you would like to. So uh, essentially we're grading the adjacent areas uh, for functionality of that park. So we have a tot lot, a sport court right now provisioned for 
uh, basketball, but that can be a number of different things, uh, potential gardening area. And also almost half of that is completely open space. So that can be just uh, more of a free flowing freestyle kind of uh, functionality. If um, you know individuals want to walk their dogs, play soccer, play Frisbee, that's all available on that space. And again, the only space on this site that uh, can allow for that programming of that large area is in the interior of the site. And, um, and just as far as an area, I'll just comment on that, that the total area of that park, despite kind of its arrangement with in the middle of the park, it's, uh, it's, it's about the size larger than a soccer field. So in other words, what was originally there, we did our best to essentially reallocate it to a different area of the site. Um, so I, I, I think logically, if I was the resident there, I'd say, well, why didn't you put it right along Tyrone Drive where, where you've got those townhouses? And, um, and, and, and I, I think part of that has to do with, um, from a planning perspective, from a planning perspective, the efficient use of space. And, and what it would mean if it was at the corner is we, could, we would potentially or potentially have to put some of those apartment type units closer to like a, a larger concentration of them. And that's not something that we want. We wanna have a spaced out development that allows for um, movement around it and not having large concentrations of buildings that are like um, really close together. Um, but really the, the main reason was because of, uh, because of the topography. We thought it was a great location to have it uh, raised up on the hill there. Um, and it creates a lovely area that has, is open to the sun the way, it's, the way it's been set up like that. And, and it also allows for eyes on the park. So the fact that we have units facing in, the apartment units are, are facing into the park um, on, for, for both apartment units, as well as those back-to-back -back townhouses that are actually facing into the park. So you have eyes on the park at all time, you'll have lights on, it'll be a very safe place to, to be to, for, for kids to play because it's not gonna be you know, dark in the middle of the night and, and it, won't be, it, it will be a very safe place. Okay, um, so the next question that we have is from Frank asking why the counselor is not at this virtual session. Was he asked to participate? Um, counselor Danko, we've been working very closely with him throughout. Um, I, he was registered for this session. I'm not sure that I see him in the attendance, um, mm -hmm. but yet, he is in attendance. I can see oh. him in the down in the. Oh, I'm sorry, I've missed that. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yes, we've been working very closely with Councillor Danko, um, and and he is here this evening. Although speaking to the actual application and what our submission is, I mean, Councillor Danko is also just having received the formal application though we've been keeping him informed of our plan so he'll have an opportunity to also be looking at it alongside you the purpose of tonight's meeting is for us as the proponents to um to re show to the community what we're planning and answer your questions okay um okay so i think there's an, uh, an anonymous question um, and about whether the city will purchase their property if they're not happy with this. I, uh, that's not something that we can answer. So I will, I'm going to move on from that. Um, okay. So we're getting a lot of the same questions about the neighborhood not being, um, not wanting 300, it's, it's not, not wanting this density. Um, so thank you for, for voicing your concern on that. But I think that question um, from perspective of today's meeting, and again, it's an iterative process. This is not the result. This is uh, where we're at now and part of we have continuing consultations. Um, so we'll take this feedback away from this meeting that this is also the purpose of this meeting. Um, okay, so lots of comments here and not so many questions. Uh, I want to thank you for the woman that um, told me it's Chiron and Hawkridge. I knew it was Ridge something. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, there we go. <laughs> um, 
sorry, I'm just sort of trying to sift through some of the comments and questions. Um, so I, I am seeing sort of a theme of, of why, uh, and Brian and Laurieann, I think we've answered this, but you know, why, why are people feeling like they're just hearing about this now? And perhaps also, Brenda, you could give a little context on what's typical. Um, this is our third community consultation session. Um, so perhaps I'll ask Brenda first to say, you know, what's typical in this process of community consultation? Then Brian and Laurieann talk about, you know, how we've in how we've um, been advertising and hoping to draw feedback from the community. So from a planning act perspective, um, the city requires that we provide a public consultation strategy as a part of our submission. So what we have outlined is the information meetings that we've had already, um, including this one. Uh, in addition, um, we've identified that we will have the reports and studies that have been submitted available on the website um, once the city has deemed the application complete and that um, the, the opportunity for public consultation is also provided through the public notice that will be put on the property that will identify the, the planner that's looking after. It'll have a contact person that you can call or email from at the city who will have carriage of the file from, from the city's perspective. So that's the person you would contact. And um, finally, in terms of the um, Planning Act requirements for a statutory public meeting that happens closer to the end. Um, but if for some reason, we, if this plan does change substantially through this planning process, we will likely have another um, uh, opportunity for public consultation where we, where we would advise you of what changes um, ha have occurred if they are substantial. Yeah, from, from uh, you know, a timing perspective, I mean, let's, let's just make sure that we understand what the timing was here. Uh, a public uh, proposal was a uh, public notice uh, for bid was put up by the city last last year. Uh, the actual uh, purchase of this property was finalized uh, December 17th or 18th, I believe, of uh, 2020. So you're talking about six months ago that the uh, the purchase was actually finalized with us. At that point in time, uh, we started the design process. You know, so so. <laughs> You know, we, we've been working on that for about six months. We started promoting this probably four months ago. Uh, so it was, it was fairly quick. This is our third uh, consultation um, to, to make sure that we're getting, you know, feedback from the community. And it's important to us to get feedback from the community. We're, we're community members. I mean, it's what we, what we do. We provide service in our community. So, uh, you know, so when we talk about people are only knowing now, I there's only so much promotion that we can do. We've uh, we the site with the site became ours in December, and we've been consistently trying to reach out uh, digitally during the time of COVID and lockdown uh, to inform people of uh, of what we're doing. And we're having uh, we're having consultations now. We'll continue to have consultations going forward for the next year as we go through this process. So uh, I, I don't know, Lorianne, if there's anything else you wanted to add. No, just to reiterate, we tried. I mean, we delivered hundreds of flyers to all of the houses for the other information sessions. We are, are making the information available through our websites, through the Caledon website, even through Councillor Danko's um, information newsletter, we touch base. Um, we've really tried to be open and transparent with the community. Um, so here you are and, and you are joining us and we do want to share the information and keep the communication lines going. Thank you and I do, I am cognizant of the time. We have four minutes left, but, um, and I will certainly take these questions back and we can add them to our FAQs, but there are a few, um, I'm seeing some themes in the questions remaining, which is one, how many parking units, um, parking spaces will there be? And the ratio that we're proposing, um, where does that fall with like what the city requires? So that's a question I'll pose to Brenda. And then another question to Peter to follow up is where, um, 
where the Molux system is going to be situated in the development and how will it handle things like garbage, mattresses, and other bulk items. Okay, sorry, I just had this going by mistake. <laughs> um, in terms of parking, we meet the city's, uh, the new zoning bylaws requirements for parking. Um, if, you, if you do it on a per unit um, basis, then it works out to 0.85 parking spaces per unit. Um, but the way it's been allocated is we have one parking space per um, townhouse unit, which would be 58 spaces. And then the remainder of the parking is allocated to the apartments. And the way the city's parking um, standards have been set up is it's not a simple X per unit, it's a gradation. So if you have certain units that are less than 50 square meters in size, the parking ratio is based on 0.3 per unit. If the parking, if the units are greater than 50 square meters in size, then a different parking ratio applies and it changes as you increase the number of units. So that's really the easiest way I, I, I can provide it. If, if somebody wants me to give the detailed calculations, I'd be happy to and actually once you um, are able to, once we post the planning justification report, it includes in it, as well as the, the, the traffic study, it identifies exactly how the parking has been calculated. And we meet um, zoning bylaw 05200 in terms of parking uh, requirements. We actually exceed them. The parking that's required is I think 262 spaces and we are providing 279. Great, thanks. And Peter, if you could speak just to the Moloch units and like how they how they function. Briefly. Yeah, definitely. So uh, first off, I mean, the reason why we selected Molochs is because they're discrete. They're actually majority of it is underground, uh, which allows it to be both visually discrete and also it's it's just something that uh, um, we use fairly common for uh, developments like this. Uh, in addition to it, we are planning on landscape screening or screening of some sort around it again, just to provide additional ba uh, visual barriers. So two ways that we're addressing that is, uh, so for the townhouses, we're doing something a little bit different than the apartments. So for the townhouses, uh, you actually can't see it on this drawing for, for good reason, but it's kind of on the northern end where the townhouses are, uh, just at the North Bay there, again, just so that uh, residents can, it's a short walk for them to um, use the Molochs. Uh, per uh, perfect, there it is right where the cursor is. Uh, we also have a second set tour, uh, for the townhouses on Tyrone. Uh, those are gonna have landscape screening around it, both uh, interior of the site and also from the adjacent developments uh, just, to the, just to the west of our site. Uh, one last thing that I'll mention is for the apartments, they're gonna be serviced like typical apartments. We're gonna have garbage chutes that go down into a central service area. Both of those are consolidated into one pickup area so that again, we don't have garbage kind of uh, scattered throughout the site in terms of different pickup zones. So, and that's exactly where the curve is, is where the um, garbage truck will service the two apartment buildings in one central area. Great, thank you, Peter. So I'm gonna pose two more questions. Um, uh, Brian, a comment here from Brian and Rosalind saying we support affordable housing and increased density on this site. Our kids need places to rent and people of all income levels need places to live. In addition, we all benefit from intensifying areas within the built up parts of Hamilton. We look forward to working with you to perfect this concept. It's not perfect yet, but thank you for consulting with the neighborhood. Um, there has also been a suggestion to add picnic tables to the park, which I think is a, a very good suggestion and we'll certainly take that back. The last two questions I'll, I'll pose, and, and this is for Lorian and Brian, is um, um, one, how many affordable units are we, how many units will be affordable? And so Brian, if you could, Brian and Lorian, if you could speak to the, the definition of affordable and, um, and how that works with this project. And then I think the final question is one of privacy. Um, some, uh, some people are asking about what about privacy with eight stories and and I think maybe that's a question for Brenda to speak how are we managing that from a design perspective as both Brian and I breathe in to start at the same time I'll, I'll let you jump in the Brian um our, right now, our goal is that 100% of our units will have affordable rents. What does affordable rents mean, though? That's the 
catch all, right? Because it's becoming a term that gets very, very confused and rightfully so. Um, because the governments that provide any additional funding to get these developed use average market rents, CMHC sort of published average market rents, and then they determine affordability based on a percentage of that. So we are targeting that 100% of this project will range between 80% of the average market rent and 125%. Yeah, so you know, Lori Ann's quite right. Affordable housing is quite uh, is is a confusing comment, uh, yeah, concept. So I just want to go. I'm going to break it down into two types. Okay, there are rents uh, that we that that are primarily borne by the resident, the person who lives in that unit. Okay, and uh, what we tend to target as affordable is that a person is not paying any more than about 30% of what their take home income would be. So if you take a person who is earning minimum wage in Ontario right now, $14 and 25 cents an hour, that means that, uh, for that person, uh, if they were working full time at minimum wage, that, uh, 30% of their income would be about $750 a month for rent, okay? That's when the, the burden is completely on the person who lives in that unit. What most people think of, of uh, you know, affordable housing and social housing is, is subsidized rent. And that's a whole different concept. And what subsidized rent is, it's the deepest level of affordability. A person whose income is something like Ontario Works or, or some kind of pension, who would be homeless if they did not receive some kind of rental subsidy from some level of government, okay? We're going on the basis that our rents here need to be rents that are solely borne by the tenants, the people moving in here. We cannot count on subsidies coming from the government. If subsidies do come from the government, you know, our rents will continue to be the same. So what we are looking at, when, when Lorianne identified 80%, of, uh, of the average market rent uh, for Hamilton, that means that a family income of about $33,000, $34,000 a year could rent a one-bedroom apartment here. If, uh, uh, if uh, a rent need required a three-bedroom apartment here at the highest level, the 125%, they would need a family income of $66,000 or $67,000. What we're trying to say here is that the target group for this are people who are working poor, right? Kiwanis Homes runs deep affordable units, right? We want a lot of deep affordable units. What we're finding is that most of our deep affordable units are now being inhabited by people who are paying market rent in those units because they have nowhere to go. They have no other option. And so what we're looking at here is creating options for people that they can move in, work, raise a family, and still afford to live, okay? And that means uh, paying about 30% of their take-home income in rent. Thank you. And um... I'll hand it over then to Brenda to, about the question on privacy and yes. um, and uh, the design solutions being implemented around that. Sure. Um, so first of all, everyone needs to understand these apartment units, they do not have balconies. There's, there's no balconies proposed. Um, so you're not gonna have people you know, on their balconies looking out and looking over. Um, what we've tried to do in terms of um, uh, overlook for properties. We've tried to maintain uh, significant setbacks and positioning of the building so that a limited windows are looking into certain areas. Um, so for, let's say for apartment block C, so that would be the one that's on the west side and the closest, um, so the houses that are backing onto, I'm not sure the address of the, the one person nearly really talked about a swimming pool. I know there's one that backs onto around Calvin Christian School. Um, so those that particular, um, those units are more than 120 feet away from your, from your property line. Um, where that property line is, there will be a solid board fence that will, that will be put up. And as you move further away, the less you can see. 
In addition, once you have a barrier up, you have to be up really high to be able to see from that distance away. I'm not saying that you can't see far away, um, but the way we deal with it from a planning perspective is we um, provide greater separation distance from residential development. So if you look at the apartment building that is um, oriented north-south along the western property line, that would that the smallest part of the building faces north, which would be the back of those courts. Um, and those particular units are more than 180 feet from the eight story portion of the building. So again, we're looking quite a distance away and existing vegetation as well as future um, fencing that's going to be put, put in. Those are the type of buffers that we're providing to uh, maintain privacy for those areas. Fantastic. Um, there really is sort of only one remaining question. So since I'm sorry to keep you guys about 10 minutes over, but the question is uh, technical. So I'll ask Peter, it's about the sanitary, the sanitary sewer system. So it's sort of two part one, will the, will the, will you have stormwater tanks uh, under the parking areas? And also how will a sanitary system handle the extra waste? Yeah, so I'll, I'll hit the stormwater one first because uh, they've, they've read our minds, which the answer is we do. So that's again to control peak flows during major rain events. Uh, we will be delaying the flows again, just peak demand on the city sewer system. I'll also make uh, just just to kind of reiterate, uh, we don't have a basement on this project, which means we're not doing uh, permanent dip purge into the city sewer system. Again, that reduces demands on the on the um, city infrastructure for our development. And I think there was a question on the sanitary sewer. So that's, that's a question that we'll address during the development process. Uh, we'll have to study exactly what the loads are on the existing city systems, which, um, uh, which the city will kind of reveal to, uh, as a part of our application process. But we have done uh, all that we can on our side for the moment to essentially, again, calculate the demands that are required. Uh, at this time, we feel it should be satisfactory, but again, we'll, we'll address that through the application process. Great, thank you. Um, on that note, uh, since we're running about uh, 10, about 10 minutes over, we're going to conclude the session. Uh, I do want to encourage you, again, this is an iterative process, not a final product that we're presenting here to you today. And uh, please do visit us at our we website, kaladincc.ca. There you'll be able to review the uh, previous community consultation sessions. This, uh, I will get an opportunity, it's been recorded, it will be uploaded, uploaded to our website, so if you want to go back through it or invite others in the community to view it, you can do that. You can also um, reach out to us directly um, through the contact, contact us uh, link there. So you'll be, if you have residual questions, uh, please do send them along and we will get them and answer them either directly or add them to our FAQ. Uh, so with with that, I want to thank Brian, Lorianne, Brenda, and Peter for being available tonight and, and answering um, these questions. And thank you all so much for joining us and giving us your feedback. And, um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next community consultation. So everybody, thank you very much. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you. Bye now.